Good evening. It's time for us to begin our class. As I talked about on uh, Sunday morning, we'll be looking at Esther chapters 3 through 7 tonight. Esther chapters 3 through 7. And uh, we'll let Michael come back and deal with Ezra on Sunday. So uh, Ezra chapter 3 through 7 is what our goal is tonight. I don't know how good we'll do, but we will hopefully cover quite a bit of this. Before we begin, Barry, will you lead us in prayer this morning? Evening. Amen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So if you've got your Bible, turn to Esther chapter 3, and, uh, and we'll, we'll begin there. So as we uh, talked about on, on Sunday, Esther chapter 2 ends up with the uh, assassination plot that Mordecai finds out about and gets reported to, uh, to the king. And uh, it gets also recorded in the Chronicles, and that becomes uh, one of the uh, providences of God that we find out here, how God works through this. And as, as we pointed out, and Carol noted earlier, although you never see the word God used in the book of Esther, God's fingerprints are all over Esther. God's fingerprints are all over this book. And uh, so very, very, very interesting that how, how God works uh, through these folks, and we talked about providence on uh, on Sunday. What did we say, somebody? What was the providence of? What was the uh, definition of providence? Providence. Anybody else remember? I mean, we all know, but it's God arranging circumstances to carry out His plans. God, God's God knows the end. He's working out things, circumstances to get to uh, what he's got planned. So we end up chapter two. We start with chapter three, and uh, again, that that king's name I'm not very good at it. But after these things, the king Ahasuerus promoted Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agagite, and advanced him and set him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. So. We're introduced to uh, this gentleman called Haman, and uh, part, he's part of part of the questions that that uh, we've got on chapter three. But uh, who who is this Haman? Who is he? Okay, thought to be. I'll use thought to be a descendant of King Agag. Where do we find King Agag? Okay, Exodus chapter 17, you all remember the story. Uh, let's look there, Exodus 17, uh, 8 through 16. We won't read it all, but look, look there. There's two places that, that this is used, but here's, here's one of them. And this talks about Agag, and it also talks about he is a, an Amalekite. And uh, the Amalekites and the Jews have got a history of problems. They've got a long history of problems. Uh, in, in this account in Exodus 17, there, there is a battle between the Amalekites and, and uh, the children of, of Israel. And remember Moses had his hands got heavy and his hands fell down, verse 12, Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this for memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua. 
I will utterly destroy and blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And, uh, and in verse 16, for he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So this, this Agag, and he was also the, the, the king that uh, Saul spared. And uh, anybody got that verse? I, I wrote that down. I've lost it. Anyway, when, when Saul was supposed to utterly destroy the Amalekites and he brought back Agag, they think, history will, a lot of people think that this Haman was a descendant of, uh, of this Agag. And so that's, that's one of the reasons people use for the fact that, that there was a, a, certainly a, a uh, hatred between Mordecai and Haman. And uh, part of it may have been because of the long history that that, that's been going on for, for 100 years before that. So let's look at the first question. That may help us to get started here. The first question on, uh, in class number 15, question number one, for what possible reasons did Mordecai not reference Haman? So I, I think we just, we just picked on one of them, possibly because he was a, a descendant of, of Agag and this long history of the Amalekites and, and the children of Israel having difficulties, that is one of them. Somebody give me another one. Okay. Okay. Carol said Mordecai just knew somehow that, that uh, Haman was a wicked guy that, that could, not be, could not be trusted. And uh, so, so he did not pay reverence to him like, like Haman wanted him to. Anybody else got any other thoughts on that one? Okay. Uh, there, there was a, a, a history of the Israelites only bowing down, and they did bow down before certain kings, but uh, Haman was not a king. Also, Haman thought of himself almost as a god. And the Israelites certainly wasn't going to bow down to another god. And so, uh, for reasons, Mordecai would not, uh, he, would, he would not bow down to Haman. So, as that, as that account goes, starting verse 2, all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman. For so the king had commanded concerning him, but Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. So, uh, Mordecai would not. And the king's servants saw that, and, and they asked, why do you transgress the king's command? Now it happened in verse 4, when they spoke to him daily, he would not listen to them, that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. Well, Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. So we've got this account of Mordecai telling these folks that he's a Jew. In, verses, in chapters 1 and 2, what did Mordecai tell Esther not to tell? That she was a Jew. That don't don't tell that you're a Jew. But but here we have Haman, and he is. He he said he tell tells the, these uh, guards that that he is a Jew. But and so we get when Haman saw Mordecai in verse five did not bow or pay homage. He was filled with wrath. He was filled with anger. But he disdained. He did not lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had told him of the people of Mordecai, or the Jews. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Ashuerus, the people of Mordecai. So, so here's, the, here's, the, here's the problem here. Haman gets mad at Mordecai, and not only is he not, it's not enough just to get rid of him, he wants to get rid of all the Jews. And there would have been plenty of them. There would have been many, many, many Jews, and he wanted them wiped out of Persia altogether. And uh, so, the second question, I think, has to do with how would you describe Haman? So, we've, we've talked about him a little bit. So, how would you describe him? Very, very, very prideful, for sure. Self-centered. I wrote down arrogant jerk. <laughs> it might have been... A little too much, but very vindictive. Yes, he, he was just because Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him, he was he was 
very prideful. He, he certainly had an ego problem. He, uh, and, he, and he hated the Jews. Okay, he just, it wasn't enough just to get rid of Mordecai. He wanted to get rid of all the Jews who were in the Persian Empire at that time. Uh, he delighted in his riches and power. We'll read about how he brought everybody in and all he wanted to talk about was what he had and uh, what all of his great riches were. And perhaps, you know, in a way he was a racist because he was, the Jew. He was against the Jews in particular. Uh, what about some of the folks that he surrounded himself with? Well, so were they great people? No. 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 So he didn't surround himself with the best of folks. He surrounded his, his, himself with what we would call today yes, yes people. I mean, they were just telling him what he wanted to hear. And uh, when, you, when, you, when you surround yourself with people like that, you're not helping yourself at all. No, you're, you're, uh, they, they, they agree with everything. You, you never get what the, what the true story is. So... Bottom line is, you, with him, you, you kind of reap what you sow. And what, what did he reap? He died. He built the gallows for uh, Mordecai, yeah. and uh, they were used on him. So, this Haman's not a good guy. He is not a good guy, and uh, we, we can read certainly all about that. Any thoughts, questions on, on Haman? Anybody else? Had a, anybody here think he's... We're giving him a bad rap. Okay, Carol said, even though he was wicked, God used him. We see that throughout the Bible, don't we? God uses evil people to fulfill his purposes, which he knows the end from the beginning. So uh, he has the ability to do that. Okay, so here's the, we get to verse 7. And in the first month, which is the month of Nisan, in the twelfth year of King Ahasuerus, they cast purr. That is the lot before Haman to determine the day and the month until it fell in the twelfth month, which is the month of Adar. And Haman said to, to the king, there are certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from our people. They do not keep the king's law. Therefore, it's not fitting for the king to let them remain. If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work. To bring it into the king's treasury. So uh, here's the here's here's what's happened. So Haman decides we got we got to get rid of the Jews, Mordecai, and all of his people. So what is this deal about casting lots, and what's this purr thing, and what what's all that about? Okay, Carol said this, this casting of lots is a ritual that they might have went through to, uh, to figure out the date that they wanted this, this to execution to happen, and they thought that maybe their God would influence the, uh, the, this, this casting of lots or this chance. Uh, and, and for whatever reason, this, this 12th month and the... the uh, Let's see, what day of the month was it? Twelfth month and thirteenth day. Okay. And so what, what's interesting about that dating? Okay, it gave, it gave almost a whole year. That was a whole year from where they are now. It gave them almost a whole year to try to figure out what to do about this. So even though Haman was, I guess, happy with what he had determined... It really did work out better, much better for the Jews. It gave them a whole year to try to figure out, you know, how are we going to counteract this edict that goes out and, uh, and, and take care of that. So, finishing on through the chapter, they, they, they send this out to all the people. They carry it out, and they say on this, in chapter 12, or in verse 12, on this 13th day of the first month, a decree was written and uh, sent out to everyone. And in verse 13, and the letters were sent by couriers, to all the king's provinces, to destroy, to kill, and to annihilate all the Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, in the 13th day of the 12th month, which is the month of Adar, and to plunder 
their possession. So 13th day of the 12th month is when this is supposed to happen. And as we just saw, this is the, the uh, uh, where does it say what day this is? I've lost the date. Anyway, there, there's, it's about 11 and a half months of, of time period here between when this is supposed to happen. So this, this goes out, and how do the, uh, how, it tells there, how do the Jews react to this? Obviously, great mourning. Said there was wailing and mourning, and uh, in Shushan, the, the capital, as we talked about. So after that was sent out, what did uh, the Haman and, 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 and the king do? Tells what kind of people they are. The end of verse 15. They sit down to drink. Uh, seems like that's happened a lot with, uh, with this king and, and this bunch of folks. Whenever there's something going on, they want to sit down and drink. And uh, so that's what they did. So that's the kind of people that we're, that we're dealing with here. So they cast this lot. It's called a purr. And uh, we will find out later that this became a feast day that's called Purim. P-U-R-I-M. And uh, if you haven't Look that up or Google that. That is a that is a festival that's held today. In uh, in March it was held this year, and uh, these folks, the Jews, celebrate her Purim, and they uh, they read the Book of Esther. And every time it's funny. Every time if you read that, it's funny. Every time Haman's name comes up in the book, they all boo or whistle. They all sit around booing and whistling. Of course, they're drinking too, like they always do. But they boo and whistle every time Haman's name comes up. And when Mordecai's names come up, they clap and, and applaud. Okay. I mean, that's literally done today. That is hard to imagine, but they, they do that. So, interesting. Word, wonder, what, wonder what word we get from this word purr, one that we hear every day. It really comes from the word that purr comes from, which is to cast a lot, is the lottery. So when you think of the lottery, you know, that, that word comes from her, which means it's a chance. Well, the one, one way that I read that I kind of understood it made sense to me was just like drawing straws. Y'all drawing straws, whoever gets the short straw or the long straw wins, well, that's kind of what casting lots was. It wasn't much different than that. It was, just, it was just chance, but on some occasions in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament, they, they cast lots and they expected some divine guidance to help get the right answer. You may remember one in the New Testament that was pretty prominent, very important. They cast lots to decide somebody. Yeah, to choose the uh, Judas, Judas's uh, successor. And uh, if you remember, they cast lots. There was two guys. They cast lots to decide which one, and uh, the lot fell on one of them. And uh, so. You know, at times lots were, were a uh, you know were something that they they did and they expected God to help them get the right answer, and that that I, I mentioned it one time, but it happened several times in the Bible. Uh, when the sin of Achan, remember Achan, and and uh, when when the uh, children of Israel had to figure out you know what caused them to lose that battle, and uh, if you if you go to uh, the, 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 the Joshua. 7 verses 13 through 15, it says three times they cast lots. They cast lots to find the right tribe. They cast lots to find the right family. They cast lots to get the right household. And finally, they got down to Achan. So, you know, at times, lots were used for whatever reason. When they divided the land of Canaan in Joshua 18, 8 through 10, they cast lots. When they determined who was to, the duties to be done in the temple, they cast lots for their duties, and whoever the lot fell on, that's, that was their duty to do it. So, uh, and with Jonah, they, they cast lots to uh, see what was causing the, the ship and the seas and, and then all the dangers there, and they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. So, many times lots were cast. A lot of times, you know, and, and, and with Jesus' garments, remember, they cast lots. To, uh, so, it wasn't an unusual thing for them to cast lots. And, uh, but it's interesting that, that sometimes it's just chance and didn't, didn't mean anything, but other times they expected some divine help in, in making the right selection. So you kind of got to look at the context and see what you're, what you're looking at there. But 
Haman, I don't know how long he cast the lots or what, what his process was, but he came up with this certain date that every Jew's going to be killed, young and old, little children, women, uh, everybody's going to be killed. So big problem. And now we get to chapter 4, which is the, the best chapter. So we got the Jews. It says, when Mordecai heard this, he tore his clothes, put on sackcloth and ashes, went into the midst of the city, cried and with a loud and bitter cry. Uh, he was out in front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate, clothed with a sackcloth. In every province, wherever the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. Did anybody, what, what is sackcloth and ashes? We hear about it a lot. What, what exactly is, anybody know what that is? We connect it with mourning. Every time somebody is very sad, they, they say they, they put on sackcloth and they, and they put ashes on their head or, or on their body. Uh, mostly they, the ashes are from burnt wood, they say. Uh, the, uh, and, I, and I don't know how true this is, but sackcloth is a coarse black cloth made of goat's hair that was worn together with the burnt ashes of wood as a sign of mourning for personal and national disaster and a sign of repentance, and at times of prayer for deliverance. So something bad's happened, sackcloth and ashes. We see that many times. Mordecai's putting on sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes. He's sitting at the gate. Esther sees him, and what does she try to do? Send him some clothes. I don't like him out there. That's my uncle. He's raised me. Uh, I'm sorry, that's my cousin. He's raised me, and uh, there he's sitting out there. Morning, and, and so she sends her one of her. Uh, he's a eunuch, ethic, and uh, that was appointed to her. And he went to find out what was going on with Mordecai. So, uh, verse seven, Mordecai told all that had happened. So, evidently, inside the gate, Esther wasn't aware of this decree that had went out. She didn't know. So, Mordecai tells about it. Tells about even the sum of money that Haman had promised. And I didn't talk about much about that, but that 10,000 talents of silver, was that a lot of money that Haman had promised? It was. It was more than the treasury of Persia. I mean, it was a, a, a bunch of money, which, he, which there's no way, by the way, he could deliver. But, but he, had, he had promised that, and some commentary said he was hoping that, uh, that the king would say, oh, that's too much. But and we don't see that that happened. But he promised this big sum of money, which, which he could not deliver. But Mordecai even knew about that, and he gave a copy of the edict and uh, said, take this to Esther, Esther. and uh, so he did. In verse 9, he, he took it to her, and then uh, 10 through 17, just, just great, great, great. We've all heard these words over and over again, but it's really, really, really good stuff. Verse 10, then Esther spoke to Hathach, and gave him a command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go in to the king these 30 days. So it's been 30 days since Esther had been in with the king and he, she had not been called, and there was a law amongst the, uh, the Persians that if you went in to see the king and you weren't called, you were going to die unless he held out his golden scepter to allow you to come in. So she's, she's facing that. She told that to Mordecai, and what did he say? I hear you. Let's not do this plan. No, no. He said... You're going to die. You, you, either, either way, you're going to die if we don't, if we don't do this. In verse 13, And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. If you don't do something about this, you're going to die too. They're going to discover you're a Jew. You're going to die too. Verse 14, For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. So famous, famous, famous words. Who knows whether you've come to the kingdom 
for such a time as this. And uh, if you haven't had a tough decision to make uh, regarding whatever, your life, your religious life, your church life, whatever, and you don't know, you know, what to do or what kind of decision to make, kind of think about, well, you know, well, like, like Esther. It was a difficult, difficult, difficult thing for her to do. But Mordecai, who was her mentor, said, who knows whether you come to the kingdom for such a time as this. This is what you've been called to do. This is why you're in the position you're in. So wherever we're in, what position we're in in this life, no matter where we are as far as our station in life, who knows what God may be calling us to do? So I think that's just a great verse. Who knows why, that you're in this, this position you're in right now to make a decision that's going to benefit somebody down the road. And I think we all need to, to think about that. So we know the story. Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Go gather all the Jews who are present in, in, in Sushan, Shushan, and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, day or night, my maids and I will fast likewise, and so I will go to the king, which is against the law, and, I, and if I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. So what was her, what was her response to this situation? What was the first thing she wanted to do? Pray and fast. It doesn't say, it doesn't say she prayed. It doesn't say there was prayer there. It really doesn't use that word, but... You know, we can just assume that if they're fasting for three days, that there's a lot of praying going on. And not only with, with Esther and her group, but also all the Jews that uh, Mordecai's been able to gather together. So they're praying and fasting. And at the end of the third day, Esther uh, goes in to the palace to see the, to see the king. And uh, does he, how does that work out for her? He gets the golden scepter. He holds up the golden scepter, allows her to come in, and he says, what do you want? I'll give you half the kingdom. Uh, so evidently, he, he, he's, he's enamored, at least with uh, Queen Esther, and it's, what is your request? It'll be given you up to half of the kingdom. And did she ask for what she wanted to happen right there and then? No? What did she say? Okay, let's, he, he said, if it's, if, it's, if it pleases you, tomorrow, why don't you and Haman come, and, and I'll, we'll, have a, we'll have a banquet. We'll have a dinner, and I'll, I'll prepare it. And the king says, that's, that's great. And so they, they, they have this meeting scheduled the next day. So why, why, did, why, did, she, why did she delay? Why, why did she delay? Was that a good thing, or what's your thoughts on that? Okay, yeah. She was patient. She wanted to wait till everything was just right. She had a she had a had a plan, and her she she wanted to work that plan out. Uh, so this this feast is 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 planned, and uh, so Haman goes home. Verse nine. He goes on his way. He's happy as he can be because he's been invited by the queen to meet with the king to have to have uh, lunch the next day. But as he's headed home, what, is he, what happens to him? He sees Mordecai again, verse 9. He sees Mordecai again and uh, says he was filled with indignation. So he's mad again at Mordecai. Mad at Mordecai. Everybody in the, in the kingdom is bowing down to him except, uh, except Mordecai. Which makes you wonder, why did all the other Jews bow down to him? And not just, not just Mordecai. And not just Mordecai. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. So he goes home and, and calls in his wife and his friends. And uh, as we've talked about, his ego and his, his all about me in verse 11, he calls these folks in and he, and he tells them of his great riches. Who does that? Who invites all their friends in and tells them about their great riches? Oh, my great riches and all of my wonderful children. How many, how many boys did he have? We know for sure. You know, he had 10. So something bad happens to them. Everything which the king had promoted him and how he had advanced above everybody and just, you know, on and on and on. It's all about me. It's all about Haman. And uh, the queen's invited me in and, and verse 13, yet all this avails me nothing so long as I see Mordecai, the Jew, sitting at the king's gate. 
So with all this great stuff going on in his life, he's, he's let this one fella just destroy his life. Mordecai has just destroyed his life. As long as Mordecai's out there, he is not going to be happy. And his wife said, well, here's a great plan. She's, she's right, too. Verse 14, then, then his wife Zeresh and all of his friends said to him, let a gallows be made 50 cubits high, and in the morning suggest to the king that Mordecai be hanged on it, then go merrily to the king, with the king to the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, so he had the gallows made. So there we have the gallows being made. But Mordecai is going to go to the king in the morning. He's sure the king will agree with him. They'll hang Mordecai, and then they'll, uh, then they'll have their, their banquet. Didn't turn out that way, did it? Verse, starting with verse 6, then we get this, this province of God thing being thrown in here. That night the king could not sleep. So God is at work. The king could not sleep. So one who was commanded to bring the book of the record of the Chronicles and they will read before the king. And it was found written that Mordecai had told of Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's eunuchs, the doorkeepers who had sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. And the king said, What honor or dignity has been bestowed on Mordecai for this? And the king's servants who attended him said, Nothing has been done for him. So he can't sleep, providence of God. He calls for the book of the Chronicles, providence of God. Why he turned to, I mean, there's 120 provinces. This is a huge, huge place. How did he turn to the exact place that talked about uh, what happened at the king's gate? Providence of God. He reads that Mordecai has not been rewarded for what he had done in, in reporting this. And he, so he says, well, we're, in his mind, he's going to do something about it. Talk about some really, really, really bad timing. At that same time, Haman walks in. He's going to come in to say, hey, how about the gallows? I got the other, let's hang Mordecai. He comes in and, and the king asks him, Haman, what should be done, verse 6, what should be done for the man whom the king delights to honor? Now Haman thought to his, in his heart, whom would the king delight to honor more than me? And, the king, and the, Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought that the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has the royal crest placed on its head. So he got a horse with even a crown on his head. And let this robe and horse be delivered to the hand of the one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. And parade him on horseback through the city square and proclaim before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Haman's still thinking pretty good about this, isn't he? He's, he's made what he thinks is a great suggestion, and uh, he knows things are going to work out good for him. So, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat, I can just see this with Haman. Verse 10, then the king said to Haman, hurry, take the robe and the horse as you have suggested, and do so for Mordecai, the Jew, who sits within the king's gate, leave nothing undone of all that you have spoken. So Haman took the robe and the horse, arrayed Mordecai, and led him on horseback through the city square, proclaimed before him, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. Wouldn't you have liked to have seen that? The inflection in his voice, I wonder, wonder how he said it. I bet he didn't say it very loud. But he was, he was told to do that, and how he did it, I don't know. But uh, he, was, he, was, his, he had been way up here, and now he's way down here, and he don't know half the story yet. Verse 12, Mordecai went back to the king's gate, but Haman hurried home, mourning with his head covered, for sure. Haman told his wife and everything that happened, and uh, they'd kind of changed their tune a little bit now on, uh, on things. So what, what do they say now in verse 13? What, what was her reply now? <laughs> yeah, he, he is, uh, if he is of Jewish descent, and you've already seen how things are turning out for him, uh, she says, you're surely going to fall before him. So... That morning, she was rushing him off, and we were going to have a great day, and now, he's saying, now she's telling him, this is not going to go good for you. While they were talking with him, the king's eunuchs came, hastened to bring Haman to the banquet, which Esther, Esther, <laughs> Esther had prepared. I want to say Esther every time, and my wife says, it's all right. So it's Esther. Esther had prepared. So we're at we're chapter 7, and we come to the second feast. Uh, 
If I miss some questions here, here's a state. How did the Jews react? We got that one. Do we have evidence that Mordecai believed in providence? Let's answer that one. Did we believe, do we have evidence that Mordecai believed in providence? Where do you see the providence? Okay, 414. If you remain silent, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Yeah, certainly there. But you can see, you know, we've talked about it. There's so many times God's providence is seen in this book, even though his name is not mentioned there. Uh, so, let's get, let's get to verse, chapter 7. So, the king and Haman went to dine with, with Queen Esther. So, I wonder how he feels. I wonder what his attitude is. How's Haman feeling? Not as good. He, he, he still doesn't know the, the, what we know, or he wouldn't have went. But anyway, so the, he goes to dine with the queen the, the second day. They very had the, the other bank, the dinner of the first day. And uh, again, the king asks, What do you want, Queen Esther? Uh, at your request, up to half the kingdom that shall be done. He's told her that three or four times. And she answered and gave the answer that Mordecai did not want to hear. I'm sorry, that Haman did not want to hear. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. So did the king know that she was a Jew up until this point? Or is this when he finally figures this out? And we don't think that the king doesn't say anywhere that he knew of her Jewish heritage until this, this point. He said, when she says, and my people at my request. Verse 4, for we have been sold, my people and I, and sold because Haman had offered all that money to, to have them killed. My people and I to be destroyed, to be killed, and to, to be annihilated. Had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue although the enemy would never compensate for the king's loss. So King Ahasuerus answered and said to Queen Esther, what, Who is it and where is he? Who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? I mean, he had signed the, the paper. I don't really know how he can say this. Anyway, he's, he's in love with, with the queen, evidently, and he's not, I mean, he doesn't remember that he had signed that paper. And Esther said, the adversary and enemy is the wicked Haman. So Haman's sitting right there. So Haman was terrified before the king and the queen, as he should have been. I think he sees, you know, the writing on the wall here. The king arose in his wrath, king's mad, from the banquet of wine and went into the palace garden. But Haman stood before Queen Esther, pleading for his life, for he saw that evil was determined against him by the king. So he's... he's He's there in the room alone with Esther, and uh, he's pleading for her to, uh, to spare his life. Verse 8, when the king returned from the palace garden to the place of the banquet of wine, Haman had fallen across the couch where Esther was, which was not a good move. Then the king said, will he also assault the queen while I'm in the house? As the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Uh, so, king walks in, Haman's on his knees, pleading. He's evidently, there's a couch there, and he's on the same couch that, that Esther's on. And, and the king says, you're going you're gonna, to uh, attack my wife here on, while I'm still here? And uh, but as the words left his mouth, they covered Haman's face. Who's the they, and what does that mean? Okay, the servants. Yeah, it's kind of like an execution. They covered his face like they would somebody they're going to execute. So uh, the, uh, the fate of Haman has kind of been, it's been shown now. What's going to happen? And it says now, verse 9, now Harbona, one of the eunuchs said to the king, look, the gallows 50 cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman, then the king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath was subsided. So, 
What a, what a day. What a, what a couple of days here for, for uh, Haman. He thinks everything is going to be great. And by evening of, of the next day, he's, he's hanging on gallows. And Carol told me that he wasn't hanged. He was impaled. And uh, did anybody else read that? that? That's almost worse. That sounds worse than hanging. Uh, but that was, it was a custom. That's how they, 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 they killed folks back then. If you look back in history, they impaled them on spears and things. And uh, that's what they said. Carol said so somewhere where that, that, that's what happened with Haman. My, my verse says they hanged him on the gallows. But they were prepared for Mordecai, and Haman uh, received them. And so we've got, the, we've got the Haman problem taken care of, but then with chapters 8, 9, and 10, we've got to take care of this, this law that's gone out that all the Jews are going to be killed 10, 11 months from now. And how are we going to handle that? Because what do we know about the laws of the Medes and the Persians? Can't be changed. We've seen that over and over again. When the law goes out, it can't be changed. Uh, and so we've got that law out there that can't be changed. And uh, so we'll be studying about what was done. Y'all can read that. What was done to, uh, to counteract that? And uh, was that success successful? And then that's when they started celebrating this day that they call the Feast of Esther or, or Feast of Purim, or some even call it the Feast of Lots because they, the casting of the lots to pick that day. So, bad things for Haman for sure, and then we read in the next chapter what, what happened to his ten sons. They're all killed, and then the next day they were hanged. So, Haman and his decisions uh, directly affected his family terrifically, and... Uh, you know, we can make decisions today that can affect our families as well. So we always got to be, be on guard against that. We, we didn't talk much about Esther and uh, her, her upbringing. And when we think of Esther, we, you know, in my mind, it's just a great story and she, she, all the great things she did. But what about up until the time that she became queen? I mean, her life was not that great. What happened to her parents? Yeah, they, they died. We don't know what happened to her parents. Her parents died evidently when she was really young. And then she was raised by Mordecai. And, and then this king, when, when Vashti gets, gets kicked out and he wants another queen, what happened? Yeah, they go and drag her out of the home wherever in, in Shushan and, and, and take her into the king's palace. And she becomes part of a harem at that point. And, uh, you, know, so it, you know, the first part of her life is not good. I mean, she's a Jew and a... In a foreign country, we know they're in, they're up in uh, in Persia, where they instead of Jerusalem. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. There's there's so many great things about her, and and I think that's this last question here, isn't it? Uh, describe the courage and wisdom of Esther, displayed in all these chapters. Uh, you know, she she was she had. Courage galore. When when something was coming up, she she prayed and fasted for sure, uh, and 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 obedience to Mordecai. He had raised her. He was he was much older than she was, but he had raised her as his daughter, and uh, she listened to him and, and got great counsel from Mordecai, and uh, so she listened to Mordecai and to God. She chose the right time and place to make her request to God. We talked about that when she first had the opportunity to say what's going on, she, she played her cards right, and uh, two days later got, got the decision that she wanted. Uh, she, just, she just had a lot of outstanding qualities that, you know, in the beginning her life wasn't that great, but as she, she grew and under the, the guidance of, of Mordecai, she just became a, a, a great character and a, and a great Bible character for us to to follow and, and uh, to try to emulate. Uh, she faced fear and did what was right, and God was faithful to her. She certainly had that fear to go into the king. She knew that her life was on the line, but she did it anyway because Mordecai and she knew God would, would be with her. So we got through chapter 7. I assume Michael's going back to, to Ezra, so let's, let's assume that's true. And uh, we get the rest of Esther about, uh, in about two weeks, I think. So 
Ezra, what, what number what number is that? Who would it be, Fred? Sure. Ezra 7 and 8. And what class number is that? 13. So Ezra, uh, class number 13, chapter 7 and 8 for, uh, for Sunday morning. 